The greatest diversity in the plant world is in angiosperms, in our flowering plants. Here we will discuss the biology of flowers. Any plant that produces flowers or fruit are angiosperms. Angiosperm, the term, comes from angio, which means vessel, and sperm, which means seed. This refers to the fact that seeds are enclosed in a carpel, which is a modified fold-over leaf found at the base of a flower. More specifically, at the base of the pistil, which is the female part of a flower. Seeds develop from an ovule inside the carpel. As that ovule matures into an ovary, it is now officially a fruit. As I mentioned before, angiosperms are incredibly diverse. However, all angiosperms fall in the phylum Magnoliophyta. In that phylum, there are two classes, which essentially are the dicots and the monocots. All of these plants feature flowers. Now, what a flower basically is, is a modified stem bearing modified leaves. They are modified because they now have new functions. Functions that differ from their traditional use. The first flowers were quite primitive and lacked the showy parts that we see today, such as petals. Pictured here is a fossil and an illustration of what the first primitive flowers look like. You notice that there is a carpal and a stamen, the female and male parts, However, there are no showy petals. Flower development begins with embryonic primordium that occurs in a bud. The flowers occur at the end of specialized branches called peduncles. At the end of the peduncle is the receptacle. Most of the flower parts are attached to the receptacle. All of the flower parts are modified leaves. Let's look at the basic structure of a flower. Just above the receptacle are the sepals. Together, the sepals are called the calyx. Notice in the illustration here that the sepals are green. Again, anything green in a plant can photosynthesize. On a flower before it blooms, all you see are the sepals. They protect the developing flower on the inside. When the flower blooms, the sepals bend back. Above the sepals are the petals. The petals collectively together are called the corolla. The primary function of petals is attraction. Often they are showy, have bright colors, and sometimes they have scents. Some plants have flowers that do not have sepals or petals. This is because the function of petals is not needed. Petals are needed when pollinators are required to transfer pollen from one flower to another. In the grass family, which features plants like this barley pictured here, pollination happens via the wind. Because grasses use wind instead of pollinators, they don't need petals. Now the reproductive parts of the flower are the stamens and pistils. The stamens are where pollen production is. A stamen consists of an anther where the pollen is actually made and the filament which attaches it to the receptacle. The female part, the pistil, consists of three parts. The stigma, the top part where pollen lands, the style, the long tube that connects it to the ovary at the base. Inside the ovary is the ovule. The ovary is what develops into fruit once the plant has been fertilized. Ovaries evolved from carpels, which again are modified leaves. Plants, depending on the species, can have multiple carpels, 
a single carpal could have multiple ovules or several carpals could each have their own ovule. Each scenario gives rise to a different type of fruit. Now where the ovary sits may differ between different species of flowers. If the ovary sits on top of the petals, it is referred to as a superior ovary. However, if the ovary occurs below the petals, it is referred to as an inferior ovary. An example of a superior ovary would be in the buttercup family. And an example in the inferior ovary would be the rose family, which includes apples and pears. Now, what we just learned about is the description of a simple flower. But just like leaves, flowers can be compound. So you essentially have a structure that's made of multiple flowers. A group of flowers is called an inflorescence, and they can take many different formations as pictured here. In the center top of the illustration, you'll see what is a simple umbel, an umbrella-like shape. This is characteristic of the carrot family. You might also notice on the top right, the catkin formation. We see these in several species of tree. A lot of flowers in our aster family, like sunflowers, daisies, and mums, are compound flowers as well. Now, all angiosperms in this phylum are heterosporous. This simply means that they have both male and female parts. When we're talking about the alternation of generations that we see in plant evolution, angiosperms are sporophyte dominant. The gametophyte stage is greatly reduced to a couple of cells that incur inside the pollen or ovule. Let's discuss the formation of male and female gametes. These processes take place before pollination and fertilization. In regards to the female gamete, a structure known as the megasporocyte, a diploid structure, undergoes meiosis, producing four haploid megaspores. So what you essentially have are four small cells, each with a single set of chromosomes. Three of those will degenerate and one will remain. In that one remaining megaspore, the nucleus will undergo a replication event. This will repeat two more times until there are eight nuclei inside the megaspore. Those eight nuclei form two groups and move to each end of the cell. Thus, there are four nuclei on each end of the cell. One nuclei from each end will then migrate to the middle. What we will have then are three nuclei at the top called antipodals, two central nuclei in the middle, and three nuclei at the bottom of the cell called synergids. At this point, the female gametophyte is ready for fertilization one of the synergids will become the egg. This egg will fertilize with a sperm from a male gamete. Male gametophyte structure is similar to the female, the difference being you do not have three cells degenerating after the initial meiosis. So you begin with a microsporocyte, which is diploid. It undergoes meiosis, resulting in four microspores. These microspores are haploid. The four microspores develop eventually into pollen grains. Inside each microspore is a nucleus with a single set of chromosomes. The microspores undergo mitosis. However, instead of producing two identical daughter cells, instead, a cell is developed on the inside of another. So what you have 
is a large cell referred to as a tube cell with its own nucleus, and inside of that, a smaller cell called the generative cell, which itself also has a nucleus. On the outside of the tube cell, there will be changes to the outer layers. An exome forms, which is specific to the species. The exome is the outer layer. It is finally sculpt. It also contains chemicals which will react to the stigma after pollination occurs. The purpose of the tube cell is to form something called the pollen tube, a long channel to transfer sperm from the top of the stigma to the ovule. The purpose of the generative cell is to produce two sperm. So after the production of the pollen grains and the maturation of the ovule, pollination can happen. This is the transfer of pollen grains from an anther to a stigma, usually from one flower to another. Following pollination is fertilization. Sperm from the pollen grain are sent through the stigma, through the style to the ovule where the sperm can fertilize the egg. It's after pollination when the tube cell starts to do its thing. It develops a long pollen tube and the generative cell begins to develop two sperm. The pollen tube is a long tube structure which extends through the stigma, through the style, eventually reaching the ovule. Here is a picture demonstrating a pollen grain with a long pollen tube. You can see inside of the pollen tube that there is a vegetative nucleus for which the two sperm cells arose. Just as there is great diversity in angiosperms, there is a large varieties in differences in flowers. Some flowers may have a single ovule in their carpal. This kind of situation results in the formation of a fruit known as a droop with a single pit. Some carpels may have multiple ovules divided up into little sections as pictured here. We can see here that this would eventually develop in a fruit with multiple seeds. When we covered the structure of a flower, we described all the parts the flower could potentially have, which includes sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. However, in nature, there's lots of examples where one or multiple of those structures is missing. In a complete flower, all the parts are present. There are stamens, petals, pistils, and sepals. However, an incomplete flower, one of those parts is missing. Now, if the flower has both male and female parts, stamens and pistils, that flower is referred to being perfect. An imperfect flower occurs when there's only stamens or only pistils. On mon I'm sorry, on monoecious species, you have imperfect flowers and the male and females are separate but occur on the same plant. In dioecious species, a plant will have only male flowers or only female flowers. An example of this are date palms. You have male date palms and female date palms. So in order to develop fruit, you want to plant both male and females in close proximity to each other. Over the course of evolution, flowers evolved to become more and more specialized their parts also becoming more and more specialized. Primitive flowers, as we learned earlier, lacked petals and sepals. But once they developed petals, often they were arranged in a simple radial fashion. These flowers exhibit radial symmetry. In other words, you could draw a line through the flower in any direction and be able to fold it in half and see two equal symmetrical sides. Over evolution, as a result of interactions with insects and other pollinators, these flowers developed more specializations 
more changes to accommodate their pollinator. Bilateral symmetry occurred. Orchids are the great example of bilateral symmetry. You have petals that function as banners to attract, and then you have petals that function as little pedestals for the insects to land on. Even further in evolution, we now see plant parts on flowers that are even more specialized that come to resemble things non-plant-like in order to attract pollinators. We may even see petals that resemble insects, for example. As evolved as these flowers may be, functionally their purpose is the same, to attract pollinators, to bring pollen so that fertilization can happen, seed formation can happen, development of a fruit, and ultimately dispersal of seeds. This concludes our discussion of flower biology. Angiosperms do something similar as the pines, which is double fertilization. Both sperms have a job. One sperm unites with the egg, forming the zygote and then becoming the embryo, the developing plant. The other sperm unites with the central nuclei in the min middle and then develops into something called the triploid endosperm. Endosperm is the nutritional food that supports the embryo as it develops. After this, the seed coat forms and the fruit develops. Inside the seed, the embryo develops with cotyledons, seed leaves, and other essential plant parts.